background and uh, then we'll launch in. Um, there are really two parts to the Wilmerson MIT program. One part is our Invention Education Wing. And for the past 14 years, we have been issuing a call for proposals that's national in scope. And uh, each year, 35 teachers uh, are selected. Um, they've put a team of high school students together, typically 10, grades 10, 11, 12. They've found a problem in their backyard that they want to build a technological solution for. And so they apply to us, and we go through a process, ultimately selecting 15 teams. And those teams receive $10,000 apiece. The amount is to stipend the teacher or whoever supporting the students um, for their time, because typically these projects happen outside the school day. And then the rest of the amount is for the materials for the team to build their invention. And then we supplement uh, the grant with support from staff who serve on my team, as well as connections to people with the technological expertise that may need to um, help facilitate the student's discovery process and building work along the way. Not tell them what to do, but help them find the next set of resources they need for what they're working on. Um, so every year, without fail, uh, we, they, they bring their working prototype at the end to MIT for a big uh, end of year culminating celebration that we call Eureka Fest. Our next one is only two weeks away, so if we seem like we're hyperventilating, that's why. Uh, it's uh, June 19th through the 21st. There's information about it on our website. There's no registration fee, and you are welcome to come and take a look and talk with the students about the work they've done. Um, we also, because we found that all students can learn to to and develop as inventors and create a working prototype, uh, regardless of their backgrounds. And this is not just an activity that's limited to the gifted students. And so, but we did find that if students haven't had some background skills in building or in um, technology, and they come to this you know, with limited background knowledge, uh, then it's harder for them. And so we actually have eight free guides on our website that we give away and kits of materials that, that support the development of the hands-on skills and the ways of thinking as an inventor. And we also give out grants for that. The other side of our um, um, shop is around our prize programs. And Betsy Boyle, who's here today, leads our prize program efforts. Um, one set of prizes goes to undergraduate teams, and we can support community college uh, teams, but we've never really had a winner in the community college category, so I hope those of you from community colleges will help us uh, change that. Uh, so we award four uh, prizes of, of $10,000 apiece to undergraduate teams in, in categories, eat it, cure it, drive it, and use it. And then we also uh, give teams to graduate students in those same categories, and they get um, $15,000. And again, this is national in scope. We uh, scour alumni magazines. We go to department websites. We try to find students who would qualify for these prizes. So we get about 1,400 names that we are able to gin up across the year. And then we email and say, please apply, please apply. And I can just tell you, we could take more applicants. So if you can help us you know, get that, that word out. Uh, those college prize winners actually come to this culminating event and serve as mentors as well for the high school teams. And then we give out a $500,000 prize to a mid-career inventor, no more than 25 years post-BA. And we give the prize. Um, that's been going on for 24 years. And we give that prize so that there's a role model out there, the rock star of inventing, if you will, that can, again, serve as, as a role model. So I came to this program uh, a year and a half ago. Um, 
because I was intrigued. Because it's, even though I'm a person who's like uh, an optimist, you'll see that in the way I talk, uh, I had no idea that young people could actually be inventors while they're in high school and create such wonderful inventions. And seven of our teams have even gotten patents for their work. It's a, we coach them a bit on how to protect their IP as they're going through this process and to do that before they bring their prototype uh, to MIT. Um, so then I got to researching, because I'm also a, an ethnographer, and I got to researching what is it that the young people who engage in this work are getting out of it. And uh, the findings are pretty astonishing. Um, for a lot of the, the kids, um, this is the first time when they have to present their invention to their community and get feedback on their design, it's the first time they've had a real conversation about a real topic with adults. It's the first time that they've felt valued for the work that they are doing and like they're making a contribution to their community that's so important that they can't fail. They have to do it because so many people are counting on them. You know, things like this show the power when it's something the students have selected because they care about it and they see people in need all around them. And it changes lives. Our research shows, for ex I want to give you one example and then I'm going to stop talking. Um, but it's particularly important to me to share because I, I've also run across the statistics many of you probably know that if you look at the prolific patent holders and leading inventors, they're 90% male. 95% Asian or white. So, you know, we may have a lot of makers and inventors out there, but they're not learning how to patent their work and benefit from, from that work that they're doing. And we can, we can teach that. And so this particular example I'll give uh, is a group of young Latinas from a school in Southern California um, who there was a DIY girls after school program, and one of the leaders decided this is something the girls should learn to do. And so the girls had no STEM in their background, didn't get it from school, um, and they decided that what they really wanted to build was a solar tent for homeless moms and their kids to be able to charge the cell phones that the county gives them. And the Girls, when we asked them, well, how did you pick this as, as what you want to invent? They said, well, you know, we're just a paycheck away from that. So they really empathized with this need. And so long story short, it wasn't easy for them. They had to use a lot of online videos to learn, learn the technical skills that they needed, but they succeeded. And the one young woman who was part of the research study actually ended up enrolling uh, in Georgetown and uh, pursuing a computer science degree pathway, something she would have never thought of. And so, you know, we can make a difference in the lack of diversity that we're seeing among patent holders by giving kids these, these opportunities. Now, how, you know, I mentioned that we've been doing this work with young people for 14 years. We have 229 uh, sites across the U.S. that have participated in this work. But that's not good enough for me. I want to see these kinds of learning opportunities in, in high schools as part of the regular school day. I don't want kids to have to do it after school. So how do we as a community open our spaces, bring our technical ca capabilities together with educators to give these opportunities in the school day? So there's a group of us who are thinking we need to create uh, and cultivate a set of online resources and more of a systems approach to bringing the spaces and the technical uh, advising uh, to educators and adults willing to help kids. And so we are starting that conversation at this conference, which is why I handed these postcards out. It's our first attempt to bring people who want to do that kind of work and build pathways for making, inventing, and entrepreneurship for kids that go from middle school on up. And so if you want to be part of that work, um, let me know or come, come have be part of the dialogue at the conference. So I'm going to pass what I have left around again. If uh, those got stopped anywhere, if you can keep passing them around. Um, switching to what our charge is. Yeah. The research you mentioned, is it yes. somewhere online? 
Um, I have one uh, publication that was, uh, it's in press, but you can access it. And um, it is in the Thinking Skills and Creativity Journal by Elsevier. And it's the special edition on creative failure. And so what we were looking at is of these uh, students that we were researching, how and in what ways they're, they, our students always tell us, 95% say, uh, one of the things that this activity taught me is to learn from failure. So we did the study to understand what did they mean by learning and what do they mean by failure. And so our paper around that is, is on that journal. Um, also, the uh, National Academy of Inventors has a journal, the Technology and Innovation Journal, and they're doing a special edition on the gender gap in patenting. And we have an article that is coming out in that. It should be out, that journal should be out within the next month. And so this uh, example I was just giving you is part of an article we published uh, for that journal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where mm -hmm. do we go to the final slides, for example, for the community college um, contest uh, for the grant application? Uh, sure. On our website, um, uh, Betsy, you want to give out the URL? It's limelson-mit.edu. That's right. And you just click the tab that says prizes, and there's the big prize and the collegiate prize. What was that, MIT? Um, it's limelson.mit.edu. Why don't you put that in the Slack channel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on there, you, you'll see how to, how to um, you, the students can apply for the student prizes. Uh, the $500,000 prize is a nomination process. Um, the grants for the high school teams uh, is an application process. A teacher applies by April of each year. And then our, uh, our eight, what we call junior varsity event team guides are under the resources section of our website. You click on JV event team guides and you scroll down to see all eight options. You can source your own materials or you can order them already put together as a kit at cost. And then we, uh, if you contact us, we provide 40 sites with the materials for two of the kits. Each year, we ask that you help us out with some assessment of the impact of that with, with 20 kids. Uh, but um, we, we can work on that with you. Any other questions before we keep going here? So, so the purpose of this session really is, you know, we don't know if the maker community is interested in adding the inventing element. I call it making with a purpose. Um, but if there is interest, the question then would be, is there some sort of next step that we can take together? And so I was asked in this session for us to brainstorm a set of next steps that then after lunch, you guys could decide uh, through some sort of dot making process, which next step has the most momentum and then we can carry that forward. Unfortunately, I have to leave after this session, so I won't be there to support the follow-on project dialogue. So if there's someone in this room who wants to step up and play that role for this group, uh, that would be wonderful. David will? OK, David's going to do the follow-on after lunch in the next step. So um, why don't we have that brainstorm conversation? What would you be interested in potentially doing that supports the, the young people or the educators you work with, um, with being able to uh, take a next step that combines making, inventing, and even entrepreneurship? Yes. So uh, we've been working primarily with adults um, rather than high school students, makes a little different perspective. But uh, we've been trying to develop a prototype product pipeline, and one of the things we want to do is really identify the stages where you're in like ideation, what sort of resources do you need, then you go to the next step, and the next step, and then we can kind of put people in those buckets or allow them to self-identify so that we're able to help them connect to whatever resources are broadly available. Uh, or help to understand what sort of things we need to research as far as maybe getting them in touch with the local fabricators. I think that making the invention um, and walking through that process and also bringing stories of people who have patented and then maybe people who have decided that there's other
other methods of protection other than patenting, like just being first to market or the, you know, so being able to have those conversations appropriate to each stage. So I, I'd like to see that developed as a pipeline and then we could do it with others. Right. So if you could lay out the steps that one goes through and then be able to opt into a group that's the step you're in, the part of the process that you're in. Yeah, like the, the various stages. Stages. And it's, it's not cookie cutter, but it would be a way to uh, sort of make it relevant to people. Mm -hmm. Because we found we've done a lot of sessions that are general about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but it seems that people are often, they're driven by their specific project. And so you have to make the uh, content relevant to the place that they're at. Right. And so we're trying to figure out how to uh, bundle and present that in a way that's manageable. So one of the presenters who will be at this event, the, the gentleman's name is Carlos Osorio, and he has worked with many adults to develop inventions and to, to get to the final product stage, and he's mapped out the whole pathway and has developed a set of online resources he's giving away because he's trying to help more oh, people do this. I, I won't be at the conference. Uh -huh. I'm from Connecticut. So okay. Carlos uh -huh. Osario, O-S-A-R-I-O, and his nonprofit is called Yukin, Y-U-K-E-N. And so um, there are loops that have all the stages and the different parts within each stage, and you can click on and dig down on resources. Um, part of the challenge in what you describe is inventing is a non-linear, iterative and recursive process. So I'm not sure you ever know what stage you're in, but <laughs> that you, you see parts of that in his resource. And if you can't find it, just email me. Can yeah. Sure. sure. The question is, um, you know, we're all here because we care one way or another about in invention and entrepreneurship. Um, but it, are there some areas of mutual interest that can be uh, focused on in some sort of follow-up project after we leave here today that we can form some subgroups to work on? And um, so we're trying to surface what those are. And then after lunch, David will be helping to uh, facilitate a group dialogue of concrete steps on how we'll work on whatever the top voted project is. So I don't have really an answer to that question, but more of an mm -hmm. exemplar. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy that I'm blatantly borrowing everything that I've moved in my class from is a gentleman by the name of Don Wetrick mm -hmm. um, in, in Indianapolis. Uh, he has been doing a class for the past few years, past few years called Innovation and Open Source Learning. Uh, where he has had high school students come in, invent, create, take things to market, um, and just do some really amazing things. Um, he, he motivated me to go from ed tech back to the classroom so I could try to replicate some of those things in my community. How do you spell so his last name? W-E-T-T-R-I-C-K. Um, he, is, uh, he has a, um, a, I could be his PR guy, he's an evil one. Uh, he's got a podcast started up. Um, it's all about his stuff going on there. And, um, yeah, it, he, he's doing exactly what you're talking about, and he's been doing it for a few years now. Great, um, great, great stuff. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing a similar thing. Um, what I did was, we've got a bunch of members that come, because I live in Phoenix. There's a lot of innovation going on there. There's also a lot of corporate people. And they come to these maker spaces, and they're saying, oh, I'm just here to just cut something up. And oh, what are you doing? Oh, this is stuff I never did before. Nobody has this stuff, so I had to go build it myself. Can you help me build it? And I said, well, what about patenting this thing? Oh, I'm not going to have enough money to ever do this. So I sort of got, got with all the other makers in town and said, well, why don't we make it frictionless? So when somebody's in the maker, photograph this stuff, get it documented, and get it so that they don't have to worry about the patent. They don't have to worry about all this stuff. And then we took it even one step further and said, well, because I you know, grew up in a whole corporate environment. I went to, you know, did aerospace, you know, the whole bit. And they had a whole culture in invention. They had all these lawyers we'd never even seen. So I said, why don't we take all of those um, things that the big corporate culture just kind of hides, you know, the accounting, all the amenities, all of that kind of stuff. It's not about just the bean bags and the free food. There's a lot of other stuff going on. And lo and behold, all this stuff is a big, can be available to every little makerspace if there's a way you could do this frictionless. Ah, so sort of a resource center for protecting IP and, and 
those kind of, and making and getting products to market. Yes. So the idea there is is that somebody comes into the makerspace, they're doing their thing. Can you get it so that they don't have to know? Just like I was an engineer when I got out of college. I, they had applied for like 20, 30 patents I was working on. I didn't even know about it. The <laughs> lawyer took my stuff and did a, a patent application, and that was done. And you know, I think I got 20 bucks for each one or something like that, uh, and free lunch or something. But the idea was, was that why was it that all these people were applying for patents? And not because they individually went after them, mm -hmm. but because there was an there, infrastructure to support. It was an invisible infrastructure. Right. Right. Okay. Because if my so boss came up to me and says, would you apply for a patent? Can you sit there and research all this stuff? I would say, hell no, I don't have time for that. Right. Right. Okay, here we're going to make people happy. Yeah, so I'm in a similar situation where um, uh, I run a makerspace and we'll get people come in with ideas for inventions. And uh, I mean, that's, you know, sometimes they come in, they have this idea, and they just they don't understand really what the makerspace does, and they want someone to actually just make it for them. Or, or other times, it's just they don't <coughs> have guidance. Um, so, uh, so JR and I, we both have makerspaces in, in Connecticut, different cities. So, um, and we, you, you guys have actually done where they did a meetup on that's called like an invention to prototype. Um, so, we're looking at doing the same thing. But the idea is because we get all these people coming through, and sometimes it's just, yeah, we, um, you know, we don't really do that, or, uh, you know, you need someone who does injection molding, or the idea is to get all these people together um, and provide sort of resources and, and, and say, okay, well, um, we do have some people who have gone through the process, so, you know, let's, um, let's go ahead and, and get you set up with those people as well. But to, to get sort of this culture going where there, there's something in place, but I think what would be helpful, too, is there, there's... It seems to be a lot of funding for like high school students, but there's a huge market up there of just people who just have their inventions. And if we, if there were like contests where we can say come and submit your invention, and you know maybe there's a little uh, little funding. It doesn't have to be much, but a few thousand dollars to just kind of get off the ground or take it to that next step. Then I think that would allow maker spaces to uh, kind of take advantage of that and and really create um, this community uh, and culture of people coming in. Get that, that wheel rolling of just submitting um, ideas and inventions and, and, and have that take off within makerspaces. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, I was just going to second the, the idea that a, a, a pipeline that allows somebody to, to patent something really easily is probably a really, really good idea. Uh, I know that personally, the first patent I did was immensely difficult and really expensive. 15 grand and like you know, a couple of years of work back and forth. And then, and then once I found a really good patent attorney, the, 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 the subsequent patents have been cheaper and easier to do just because I, I trust the other person enough to, enough to offload it, like a lot of the work that they do to them and it, it, just, it just becomes easier. And uh, um, I'd also say that um, sharing resources and knowledge about things uh, that I, th I feel like that's the strength of, of a makerspace is like community. When somebody learns about something that's useful to them and shares it with others, that that's uh, one of the most useful things to come out of makerspaces. There are a couple of things that I just wanted to, to mention. Uh, Triz 40 is a is a framework for like how to invent things that I found. It's very spell that. T R I Z. It's like 40 different things you can do to stuff that help you invent. Like if you it's actually pronounced trees. Trees. T -R -A -Z, okay. Yeah. Those developed by a Russian inventor. It's, it's, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So and, and and then um there's something called axiomatic design that I found that just really helps you split up what you're doing into subparts that are more easy to, to work with. Uh, so uh, regarding patent. Uh, related issues. Um, so I have uh, a few ideas that I, that I would love to patent at some point. Obviously, the big barrier is getting the right people and you know getting the right people in front of you, so you're not bankrupt yourself trying to get something off the ground. Um, but uh, some of my other projects, like this, this little modular project I'm working on, I'm wanting to bring it to the community as an open source project, which means that I'm not eager to patent it because I want it to be a community embraced idea, and so. Um, there's, you know, I'm bringing it to the open market, I'm putting it on GitHub, I'm, I'm you know, making sure 
it's well documented in the public space, but my concern is, okay, somebody who has a money interest sees it and goes, hey, that's a great idea, I'm going to patent that idea that's in the open, spec, in, in the open space. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there might be something, some room for like a, a patent angel foundation of some sorts, <laughs> that people who have ideas that they want to give them to the community, it's a legal entity for lawyers that will um, go through the patent process, but it is for the purpose of the community use. So there's the, the public use um, legal jargon built into that whole concept. So what you just described is like maps perfectly onto the earlier resource that I gave the openinventors.org. That's exactly. That was openinventors.org. So um, I will, let me write that down once I'm. Uh, or I will. I will write that down and let somebody else take the point. <laughs> and I, maybe you can cool. help us out on this. I'll talk, I'll, I want to address a couple of issues. Um, as far as getting funding for your patents, I actually do that. Okay. I finance patents for startup companies. Cool. But I'll tell you, I've looked at over, you know, probably close to 150 inventions this year alone. I like two of them. Most of them are awful. And yeah. I'll tell you that, okay? And, and, you know, it's not that they're awful. It's just they don't address a big, a big enough market. There's, you know, there's, it, it's the business part of it that fails, not that, hey, it's a great idea. Um, one of the, these, that's not why I'm here. I'm more interested in how people deal with this idea of collaboration. The biggest problem that comes out of makerspaces when you have a patent is inventorship. Who thinks that they are an inventor? Not who actually is, but who thinks they are. And these problems arise not, you know, not at the day where we all come in, we're singing kumbaya and everybody's loving each other and all that. It's after, as things start to evolve. Oh, I got a patent on it. I got the patent on this idea. And you're like, oh, well, didn't you and I talk about that? <laughs> and you're like, well, I think I should be, you know, being, a, being an inventor is a big thing. And all of a sudden you feel slighted, you feel hurt, you know, and, and it's not that you're a bad person, but you, it, you know, you're probably a nice guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're from Nashville, you guys are nice. Um, but how do we as a group deal with that? And what I suggest is that we have an agreement ahead of time that just says this is how we're going to, we're going to behave nicely. And if I'm here to help you with your invention, I want you to I want you to walk away with it, and I want you to be able to do something with it. I'm not, I don't want 10% of your company, I don't, you know, all that kind of nonsense, we got to get away from. The idea, I'll, I'm in the patent business, okay, ideas are the cheapest part of this. The ideas, <laughs> let me just say, the ideas don't really matter. It's execution that matters. And after you've executed, you look back and, wow, that's a great idea. But it took a lot of work to get there. But you all remember the Winklevoss twins and Facebook? <laughs> Snapchat paid $134 million to an inventor. Square paid 30 something million to another one. These kind of problems happen. And the, I'll tell you how I found this. I, I was taking a class to become a certified patent valuation analyst. So, you did a merger, and we can look at the patent and say, oh, they're worth $3 million, whatever. The guy says, oh, if you find out that this patent came from an accelerator, or an incubator, or a makerspace, or a co-working space, cut the value of the patent in half. Think about that. Your guy comes out of his makerspace, and he creates a, <coughs> he gets a patent. He's taking the thing to market, and he want, his company gets acquired cut the value of it in half, purely because he was in your maker space. Is there, there is a way to solve that problem, but it's about putting agreement in place, not onerous, and it's all, you can help somebody if you choose to, and you don't have to. I mean, it's, it's, can you explain why it has less value? Because of the risk of inventorship. Because of the risk of 
you and I were standing around the coffee pot and I was telling you about what I was working on and you, oh, well, why'd you do that? Oh, you know, I thought about that two years ago, but it rolls into my patent and I don't name you as an inventor. So this now is a little lost. bit of a, a different situation, but yep. similar. Um, so our teams that invent, you know, when they create something, who owns the IP for that? And so, as I mentioned, we've had seven teams that have gotten patents for their work. And so I really love the team that negotiated with their school district that if any value comes from the patent, it does go to the school district, but it is for a group of students to decide how to invest the money in programming at their school. So it's a nice compromise. So it's, you know, I think we do also need to share the, the solutions that people are coming up with. So let's just say there should be agreements. You know, there's probably multiple ways to write those agreements. And so we, we do need a place where we can share these ways of addressing. Um, so that certainly, it sounds like um, uh, a for, formation of an entity that's stewarding these kinds of infrastructure supports around patenting and entrepreneurship that yeah one one reference that i give you is this book called slicing pie if you ever work with entrepreneurs give them a copy of this book called slicing pie by mike meyer and it's it's basically you know you and i are going to start a business together let's figure out how we're going to divvy up the equity and stuff and it's and it, it's a very approachable book. It's thin. It's it's easy to understand. But it's not the, you know, it, it's not. Oh, we're going to be 50-50 partners, and you don't have to work anymore. And I do all. The, you know, it, it solves a lot of those problems. I want to shift um, topics because we have like five minutes left. Um, okay. One thing we have not talked about, a lot about is. You know, when, when I stepped into this program, you know, I thought, okay, 14 years doing this amazing work, but how does it really happen? What is it that the educator or adult leader does with these teams of kids? And what is it that the people who are helping on the technical side, what is it that they do? What kind of knowledge do you have to have in order to be able to help kids do this? What do you come in with? What does our program offer in our, th we do a three-day professional development session with the educators? How does this all work? And so we've done one layer of research and we're now going into a second year of research. Um, I can see now what my team does at the Lumelson MIT program and I can see when they do it and what our process is. But what I can't currently see is the conversations with the teachers on the ground. The, uh, I know who the mentors are. I know what kinds of supports, but I don't know how they do it, how many hours it takes. What is the impact of that interaction from that person assigned to the team? So we're putting that layer of research in this year because we want to be able to get to the level of being able to say to a teacher, here's exactly how you do it. Mentor, here's exactly your role. Here's ways other people have done it. And so, you know, I don't know as a follow-on project if there are people interested in that level of understanding how to really start packaging so you have more to work with interested teachers or, or uh, educators. Yeah. So um, if I could share a quick hack about um, how I deal with ideation. Uh, I have a lot of ideas that I want to either bring to either market or to my just my personal collection of cool little things that I have. Um, and I live on the road all the time. I'm, nom I'm a nomad. Space is very precious to me. Um, and so I've adopted a plastic bag and index card style ideation. <laughs> you write down the name of the product or the idea on the front. It's very generic. Maybe a few notes on the back. You put the card in the bag. If you have any parts that go with the part or with the product, you put that in the bag as well. You put that in your collection of other projects. And that's something that a teacher or a mentor could do with all their students as well. It's like, here's your plastic bag. Again, these are, you can get these at the, at the grocery store. Um, and it's an exercise, like write down your idea or give them three bags, write down your three ideas, put them in the bags, and then you can take them home and maybe three or four five years later they might have an actual product in front of them. Okay. I, I love so, that. That reminds me of a, a film in the Lemelson Center at the Smithsonian with Jerome Lemelson who, who supported our, our, our founding. 
Um, and uh, he, his wife is talking about how he's, that he's always saying, carry a notebook and quick, Dorothy, write this down and write it legibly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we run into it all the time. We host a bunch of robotics teams. Mm -hmm. First Robotics has a really intense build season. The kids have to come up with their robot in, in six weeks. Um, they find out about it, and six weeks later, it's got to be done and ready for competition. Um, lots of the kids don't have any idea how to go from an idea to a concept, but what it always takes is a huge amount of time. And I don't know how you begin to tell a mentor. All the mentors that I've coerced into or sucked into helping with this have been amazed at how many hours it takes and how much iteration there is. And the, the thing that the kids don't aren't, aren't used to, I guess, is iteration. Is try it, fail, try it, fail, try it, fail. Just keep going until it works. Um, so I don't know how you begin to, to exactly tell the teacher how to do that, except put on your seatbelt. <laughs> yeah, you know, truth in lending, the teachers we work with repeat, repeatedly say it takes nearly 200 hours outside school for the work that they do with their teams. And it, that is part of why I'm interested in finding ways to get this in the school day. And I've run across six or seven different models of schools out there who are doing things like blocking three periods of a kid's school day. And their inventing work becomes a class. That's, uh, class. that's I, yours. I I need to document your model. I need to document these. If you could help me, give me your contact information. Because there are ways to do it, but schools are going to have to change. If they want this, they have to do it differently. Uh, I ran across another model where three school districts have pooled teachers assigned to a period like that. They all come to a central location in a co-working space. In that instance, the mayor beats up on the businesses to tell the kids problems that they have that the kids might be able to solve, and the businesses provide the money for the materials. So the school doesn't have to worry about materials. There's a, a, an adult there working with the kids. The cost of the coordinator for all of this is shared across the three districts. That's a great model for small school districts, which about three quarters of the school districts are small. So a model that works in a big urban or suburban district is not going to work in a rural. So we have to have these kinds of shared relationships. So. I was going to say, too, there's a document. If you have any model ideas or anything, you'd like to just put it online. I think that's shared with all of us. Mm -hmm. and so it's a great way to stay connected and uh, keep sharing your ideas even after this conference. Yeah, the document for this session. Yes, yes. please. I, thank you for mentioning that. Please go on uh, and add to the document. I started it, but please go on and add more resources in there. And Betsy will be adding the information about how to apply for our prize programs or our grants. Great. Any, anything else? Yeah. I was just going to say, I think, uh, I believe it's Russ over there brought up an excellent point. Most uh, people fail when they're trying to start a, a project like this because of their weakness in the business uh, kind of entrepreneurial side. So, so check, uh, check it, your local resources as far as uh, business development centers, incubator, business incubators, and so on, and work with them. I, I've done a lot of work with those over time, uh, uh, usually as somebody that goes in and, and talks about, okay, how can you make your business more efficient and, and things like that. But I found those guys to be really great resources. Okay, so David, do you have an idea about what, what we're going to be doing after lunch in our get-together? I haven't really posed a big question to the board around how do we create this on-ramp in supporting inventions that are making things fun. So we'll kind of big, big, and we'll try to really wind it down. So then we have only another hour. So yeah. we'll, we'll try and make sure that we got your name. If you want to continue the conversation, if you can't make that session, we'll send an email. Thanks, everyone.